call the ground that we've covered thus far. What is Bridgetown's position on women in eldership? That's the most frequent question asked of our staff, and we've never at any point in the history of Bridgetown Church had an official written statement defining our belief in response. Most frequent question, no clear answer. That can work for a number of theological complexities, but women in eldership just simply isn't one of them. You either have an implicit or an explicit position if you're an elder-led church, and it is my belief that doing the hard and honest work of crafting and defining and communicating an explicit position is more helpful to you, the congregation. That's how we got here. So on March 19th of this year, we announced the Committee for Defining a Biblical Position on Women in Eldership, and in approximately the six months that followed, that committee became priority number one for the elders of this church. Ultimately, we crafted a long-form, biblically-backed written statement prior to openly sharing about the process with any members within the committee to avoid groupthink or too early a consensus. We then interacted thoughtfully and critically with one, with one another's statements, which were unanimously on the mutualist side, but did contain unique nuances and perspectives. And finally, we crafted a long-form, unified public statement on behalf of Bridgetown Church, which includes our belief that both women and men can serve together and should serve together in the office of elder. We have not reached that conclusion based on a single argument, but rather on the four pillars that I outlined in our first lecture. I've offered a cursory explanation of the gist of each of these pillars to provide a level of understanding and insight that will be satisfying to some while others will hold unanswered questions, which I hope to address next Wednesday night at our second of two lecture nights on this topic, where we will return to those four same pillars, venturing deeper into the biblical deep weeds underneath each one. Finally, you heard not just from me, but from three other committee members who shared on a more personal level, offering a glimpse into their individual journeys and processes. So I'd like to conclude this evening by addressing not the theology behind our position, but instead the implications of it. What does this mean for me as a faithful and committed part of Bridgetown Church? Well, to answer that question best, I need to begin first a little bit more broadly. What does this mean for us? So there's three things that I want you to hear me say again. The first is that whatever your interpretation of scripture is, you are welcome in this uh, community, and I really do mean that. Secondly, I hope that you will form the way that you view all of life through the lens of Jesus, not reform Jesus to fit a, uh, another lens. And then finally, it is my prayer that you will be curious and self-reflective about the baggage that you carry into tonight's topic. And in terms of ensuring that's more than just lip service, but instead a shared experience, I offer you an important lesson from church history through these words which are attributed to St. Augustine. In essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity, or love, as it's often quoted. These words summarize how a local church body can maturely live in the tension of theological diversity. So I want to pick apart this statement from the end back towards the beginning. First, in all things, charity. How can we relate to one another with grace and love as we try to faithfully undertake the magnificent and challenging task of faithfully interpreting God's word? How can our agreement be stronger than our disagreement, our character stronger than our reason, and our soulful humility stronger than our intellectual certainty? Well, in the words of the Apostle Paul, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. We start with charity because without it, we're an echo chamber or a clanging cymbal. Love must rule over all in our thoughts, speech, and actions toward one another or nothing else matters. Then in non-essentials, liberty, meaning that a healthy church is one with the right measure of theological diversity. There can and in fact should be varying interpretations, emphases, and perspectives in a healthy body of believers when it comes to the debate for and decide for theological categories. Far from weakening or dividing a church, in a mature body, this level of liberty strengthens and, and matures a church. Finally, in essentials, unity. While theological diversity is a healthy and maturing thing when it comes to the non-essentials, there are other truths which shared belief is essential for health and maturity. So that, of course, leaves us with the question, well, then, what are the essentials? 
Well, if you've been through basics at Bridge, to join a Bridgetown community, that should be old news because I give a pretty good chunk of the first session of basics to answering that very question. And if you've not been through basics, it's about to come back around, you're invited. For tonight, I want to define just two of these essentials, not an exhaustive list, that I believe are particularly pertinent to our discussion, the Bible and the gospel. So first, the Bible. We believe scripture is our absolute and first authority. We believe the Bible composed of the Protestant Old and New Testaments is both true and authoritative. We make that claim because we believe that God divinely inspired the original authors through the Holy Spirit to pen them. Practically, that means that when defining a belief on any theological topic, we do not start with our best logic cultural trends or popular opinion, but with what does the scripture teach? And it means we believe that everything the Bible teaches is God's word that leads to fullness of life. Then there's the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God himself, the creator, has come to rescue us from sin and renew all things in and through the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf to establish his kingdom through his people in the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the gospel is a summary statement of what the Bible teaches as a grand narrative, that God is a pursuing lover, Jesus is savior, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and God won't stop until heaven and earth are reunited as one. The church is a community of people distinguished from the world by these essentials. Secular culture does not submit to the Bible and the gospel as their highest authority. So what is, what is our culture's highest source of authority? It's reason and experience. What do you think and what do you feel? It's an authority that's rooted in the self. What seems right to you and what feels right to you? On the other end of the spectrum, you've got the church submitting the self to a higher authority, the scripture and the gospel, what does the Bible teach? And Jesus as rabbi, Lord, and, and king. And in the middle, you have people occupying some kind of undefined middle ground. Like, I believe the Bible matters and it's got a whole lot to offer me, but where it doesn't line up with what I think and what I feel, I tend to ignore or more or less gloss over parts of it in favor of trusting my reason and experience. And my guess is that right now in this room, there are three groups of people represented. There are those who hold scripture over reason and experience and the biblical interpretation offered on tonight's topic makes you more immediately comfortable at Bridgetown Church. Then there will be those who hold scripture over reason and experience and the biblical interpretation offered on tonight's topic makes you less immediately comfortable here at Bridgetown Church. And then of course there will be some who hold your reason and experience over scripture and still the biblical interpretation offered on tonight's topic makes you more immediately comfortable at Bridgetown Church. So I wanna to speak to that third group for just a moment, those who are likely occupying that undefined middle ground. And I just want you to hear me say this very clearly. You are building on a false foundation. As a reminder, faithful, devoted followers of Jesus who share the same source of authority find themselves with integrity on either side of tonight's question. I believe this is a debate for topic in part because I'm less concerned about the destination than the way you get to where you get to. If you agree with our church's non-essentials by stepping over our church's essentials, you are building a house of belief that is bound to crash the second a storm comes, and it will. Now, I wanna to speak to the second group for just a moment, those who hold the scripture and gospel as their highest sense of authority, but the interpretation that's been offered here tonight, it makes you less immediately comfortable at Bridgetown. Thus far, you've been given clarity. Brene Brown coined the phrase, clear as kind, and I half agree. Uh, I've seen clarity be kind, and I've seen it be really unkind. The Pharisees, for example, were remarkably clear, but in a way that distanced them from Jesus rather than drawing them to Jesus. So what makes clarity kind, helpful, beneficial, and maturing when it's paired with hospitality? And that is our aim, for Bridgetown Church to spread a table big enough that it makes room for healthy disagreement. A tragedy in church history is too much charity without hospitality. That's one reason why there are currently more than 200 Christian church denominations in the US, 
and an estimated 45,000 globally. In a healthy family, there must be healthy disagreement as we remain unified. Bridgetown Church, we are ready for this. We navigated a global pandemic, a national political splintering, and a major leadership change. We can bring healthy theological definition where there's unclarity, link arms on the other side of that, and then keep marching forward in the same mission. We can disagree on this topic, working with the same essentials and source of authority, and love one another, believe in one another, empower one another, and lay down our lives for one another. We are ready for this family. In Portland as it is in heaven, that is our vision. Practicing the way of Jesus together in Portland, that is our mission. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what Jesus did. That's how we live it out. None of that's changing. Let's keep the main thing the main thing, navigate the tension with healthy disagreement at a healthy pace, and then keep going. Next, I wanna name clearly what this is and what this isn't. This isn't the first in a domino of theological studies. There are no other undefined biblical questions we plan to look at as a church now or in the foreseeable future, nor is this the first step toward becoming theologically progressive, whatever that might mean to you. This is an honest look at scripture and landing on a biblically faithful interpretation that is well within the bounds of historic Christian orthodoxy. The future of the church is not new, it is ancient. And we have and will remain well within the ancient way. This isn't an invitation to discuss this topic as a community, your views on this topic or your experience with this topic. This is a work commissioned, completed, and shared in a healthy way on behalf of this church. And we are informing you of the theology regarding church leadership that we intend to practice and step with in the days ahead. Simple as that. This isn't an introduction to new elders. This is a defined position around the biblical qualifications of elders, specifically related to women. We do not have new elders to introduce you to tonight or next Wednesday. Our intention in the days ahead is to see our elder team grow. Our elder team is currently a bit small for a church of our size, I would say, but we wanna see it grow at a sustainable pace and we're not in a hurry. This defined position is the first step in that sustainable pace, and this defined position stands entirely on its own. And this isn't a line in the sand that you must get on board with. This is clarity with hospitality. It is clarity on the fact that in this house, a woman who meets all of the qualifications of elder laid out in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 is not disqualified from eldership based solely on her gender. It is a commitment to value and empower women and men into eldership through a biblical lens, and it is a table big enough to make room for healthy disagreement. That's what this means for us collectively. And then finally, what does this mean for me individually? Three words to remember as we close, subscribe, affirm, respect. Because the biblical interpretation of this issue is so complex, we sincerely hope Bridgetown Church to be a place where we make room for thoughtful disagreement and loving acceptance when it comes to women in leadership. We do not expect, nor do we require, that everyone who called Bridgetown home agree entirely with our belief. Instead, we maintain that all Bridgetown staff and elders subscribe to this belief sharing our conviction on the biblical teaching related to women in eldership. In layman's terms, our elders and our staff are the only people required to share this theological conviction, and we've already discussed it among both of those groups arriving at unanimous agreement. That means if you're not on staff uh, at Bridgetown Church or a member of our current elder team, you are not being asked to believe what we believe. So what are you being asked? For all Bridgetown leaders, that's community leaders, deacons, worship leaders, and so forth, we ask that you affirm this belief. Affirmation defined as shared conviction regarding the authority of scripture on which this belief is built, and honor for the leaders of the church tasked with defining and maintaining the belief. Layman's terms, if you're a leader here, we ask that you affirm the work done in service of this church 
by agreeing on the Bible as the foundational authority on which we build all of our practice and reach all of our conclusions, and honoring the elders of this church by submitting to the theology as outlined. In short, that's nothing you haven't already agreed to as a leader of this church. When you became a leader at Bridgetown, you affirmed the authority of scripture and you agreed to serve under the authority of the elders of this local church. I'm only reiterating those commitments to you tonight in light of this discussion for the sake of clarity. And then finally, for all who call Bridgetown home, that's our congregation, we simply ask that you respect this belief by humbly submitting to the beliefs of the local church body that you are voluntarily attending and serving making it your ambition to maintain the unity of this church by honoring all those serving as leaders at Bridgetown, both men and women, by never actively teaching a contrary position in a formal church environment, and by resisting gossip, bitterness, and the temptation to to sow distrust. So what exactly would it mean then to disrespect this belief that's been laid out tonight? Well, it could mean like continuing in our church, but if and when a woman serves on our elder board saying something that would let, she's not my elder, because I don't believe that, or treating any leader differently at this church on the basis of that person's gender, uh, honoring a woman serving on our elder board less than you would honor her male counterpart. Or it could mean forming a coup of friends where you rally people or turning your Bridgetown community into a class where you teach theology on a contrary position. Or it could just mean like leaving here, inviting some folks over for dinner and talking about all the things you disagree with and distrust without the people that you really need to be talking to even being present. Any form of active disrespect like that tears down the very body of believers that we are trying to build up. If you simply cannot remain in peaceful, loving, unified, honoring fellowship with Bridgetown Church in light of this decision, then I would painfully and reluctantly say it would be better for both your own health and the health of this church if you were to find a church that you can participate in peacefully, lovingly, and with honor and unity. So next Wednesday, I'll begin with another long form lecture. (laughs) Returning to these four pillars, but going on a deeper dive, we're gonna get into the biblical weeds, we're gonna address the most challenging texts to our position, as well as uncover some more biblical evidence pointing to our position. Then we're gonna have a second lecture, you'll never guess, it's also me, offering some (laughs) pastoral counsel, I've got some help for that one, Uh, offering some pastoral counsel, for healthy processing, both individually as a community and as as a community to conclude the process. That's right, just two lectures next week. It's shorter if you're thinking that. Some, some may not feel the need to come. Like tonight may satisfy your questions and you're ready to move forward with clarity and hospitality as you leave this place. Some may wanna come just purely out of interest and curiosity. And some may be wrestling with tension or holding unaddressed biblical questions because I did not turn over every stone. And if that's you, then I hope to speak directly to those questions that you might still be holding in a week's time. The aim of these lecture nights is to provide clarity and hospitality needed to empower and equip you, Bridgetown Church, to move forward united in the very direction that we've already been marching for years. One more time, in Portland as it is in heaven, that is our vision. Practicing the way of Jesus together in Portland, that's our mission. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what Jesus did. That's how we live it out. None of that's changing. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. Navigate the tension of theological diversity in a healthy way, at a healthy pace, and keep going. 